So here we are, drawing to the end of our season of Lent, surrounded by all of these wonderful images for God that we've had the chance to explore through these weeks together. All of these different windows into something more to learn about God, about who God is and how God loves us. This fabulous reminder that we've had throughout this season that whatever our most comfortable way to refer to God, whatever our most uh, familiar way to think of God, there is always something more to be discovered. However it is that we have gotten used to thinking about God, it's just scratching the, the, just the, the top edge of the surface there because God is so much more wonderful than we can ever imagine. And so here we are, surrounded by all of these images that we've had the chance to discover. And I wonder, I wonder today, if the image for God today might not be our most uncomfortable image of them all. It starts innocuously enough. It's a dinner party. It's a, a gathering of friends and family thrown in the honor of a friend who, a dear friend who's coming through town. And like all dinner parties, it is filled with laughter and talking, um, a, a table filled with food, although in that era, in that day, the table would have been very low and in the middle of the room. And the people would gather around it and instead of sitting on seats, would lean on their left elbows on their sides with their heads right near the table. This allowed their feet to be where they should be, well away from the food, pointing outward from where the food was. And we can imagine them there all laughing and reaching and talking and telling stories and gathering. Um, the one sister who has that gift of hospitality and service uh, in her bustling and in her serving, an act of worthy and loving devotion. Um, the other sister who really did try to start helping, but at some point got a, a, a sort of vague look on her face, and when everybody realized she had slipped out of the room, they just sort of rolled their eyes. Oh yes, that's her. This happens periodically. And we can picture them there at this table, at the storytelling. We can picture this dinner party, and it's not until we start going around the circle that we discover things are out of place. Just a little to the left of where we expect them, because there in the corner is Lazarus. Lazarus, the dead man who just days before was called out of his own grave by the, 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 the guest of honor at this party. Lazarus, who at Jesus' shout, come out, stumbled from his own tomb, still wrapped in the linen cloths, all bandaged up with the spices and the ointments and the lotions that we place on the, the, the bodies of our loved ones. We don't really expect to have the dead, a dead man at dinner, do we? And yet here is Lazarus gathered at the table as they host the guest of honor who called him out. And I can't help but wonder if the conversation and the storytelling would sort of eddy up against Lazarus and have a sort of hiccup in it. How do you talk to a dead man? What stories do you tell? Were his neighbors a little nervous about uh, maybe um, as they would reach for the food that maybe they, their hands might touch as though something might rub off on them? Every time Lazarus moved, did they listen or subconsciously were they looking for a, a, a whiff of the grave? How do you sit at dinner with a dead man? It was Lazarus who noticed first. This sort of a spicy, sweet smell that had started permeating 
the room. It was Lazarus whose eyes opened and he started looking around because Lazarus knew this smell all too well. This was the smell of death. And he knew this smell because when he was called out of his own grave, this is what was uh, drenched in all of those wrappings and the bandages. This is the, the sweet spice, incredibly precious, incredibly expensive. They had to be imported from a long ways away. That was an act of devotion to the body of a loved one who had died. Lazarus knew this smell all too well. And as it started permeating the room, his eyes were the ones that widened first. And he started looking, where, what is happening? By the time everybody else noticed, all conversation had stopped. Mary had slipped back into the room when they didn't notice it. And she was kneeling at the feet of Jesus. And this lotion, this ointment, a little goes a long way, but not in Mary's hands. No, her devotion and her love for Jesus required lavishness. And she anointed his feet lavishly with this ointment, rubbing it all over his feet, so overcome every cell of her body, needing to show Jesus how much she loved him and how grateful she was. She even took her hair to wipe away the ointment, the lotion there. This is an act of such abandon, such love, such worship, that it is awe-inspiring. What can you say? When Judas spoke, they all jumped. His mouth was pinched and narrow and unhappy. In the face of this lavish devotion and love, Judas was tight and pinched. Why, he said. Why so much? Isn't this too much? Couldn't this have been put to a better use? Stop her, Jesus. Stop her. It's embarrassing. Mary sat back on her heels as she waited to see what Jesus would say. Her, her hair lank with the lotion that it had absorbed. As she waited to see what Jesus would say. Leave her alone. Let her be. This is for my burial, he says. Now, I don't know if Mary knew that's what she was doing. I wonder if Mary had a sense that what she was doing was a pro uh, what, that she was being a prophet here. Would she have been surprised to discover that this is for Jesus' burial? Or would she have been horrified that this is how it was being interpreted? We don't know. What we do know is that Jesus has been marked for death. The religious leaders, the political leaders, have decided Jesus must die. And they have condemned him to death, as well as Lazarus. Because if leaders cannot count on death to be the end, then how are they going to hold on to power? And the one who can order death around, we must get rid of him. Because without death, how will we keep the people afraid? Jesus must die. And so must Lazarus. This life that Jesus gave to Lazarus is a death sentence. And so what we have today is a dinner party that is steeped in death. We have Lazarus, the dead man. Jesus, the condemned. We have the oil of anointing Jesus' body for burial. We have uh, the smell of that perfume, the smell of death 
surrounding them all. We have a death sentence that has been laid. And maybe saddest of all, worst of all, and heartbreaking of all is Judas. Judas and the religious and political leaders who are, we see, that are so tied into themselves and so curled in with their, their, their view only for their own selves and their only view for those who are our own that they can't even see that when we live like this, there is not much life that can fit in. There's not much life left in us. Saddest of all, Judas and the leaders are dead too. And this is the image for God we have today. It is God, the, 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 the corpse on the cross, the body that we take down and lay in the grave. We are left to weep over God for a love that will go to death for us and with us and because of us. Today, we're left with the reminder that God's love will not let even death stand in its way. And love unknown and unknowable and unimaginable that says to us that not even death is a God-forsaken place. <laughs>